Well, welcome to the Donahue Group. We are back after our initial shows, and we're delighted that you can join us again. Uh, we're a group of four people who live and work in Sheboygan County, and we have opinions about just about everything on the planet. <laughs> just both like everybody else. Right? On a local and uh, state and national level, and we're here just to chit-chat a little bit about some of those opinions and some of the burning issues of the day. Uh, I'd like to introduce our, our group again. We're hardly household names at this point, maybe someday, but um, to my direct uh, right I, is Ken Risto. Ken is the Social Studies Curriculum and Assessment Coordinator for the Sheboygan Area School District. That was close. That is, that is close, and or as he puts it, just a simple Social Studies teacher. Tom Paneski is a professor of mathematics at uh, the University of Wisconsin Sheboygan campus. And Cal Potter is a former state senator from this area and also in his most recent incarnation, assistant superintendent of public instruction. I didn't get that quite right, but in charge, Close of, enough. In charge of libraries. And, and me, I'm just a simple city lawyer. So um, we, uh, last time we met was just before the primary election and uh, for the mayoral race, uh, and the only state race, of course, being that for um, a superintendent of public schools. Um, and it was a surprise, I think, to a number of people. Juan Perez won, uh, not handily, but won by enough votes that uh, at least was a clear winner. I think that, if I remember correctly, Juan uh, Perez's percentage was 45%, to Mayor Schramm's 42%, and then the other five candidates kind of filling in the field. Um, and I believe out of the 16 wards in the city, uh, Mr. Perez won 11 of those, if my memory serves me correctly. I was surprised. I watched the votes come in. What do you folks think? Well, I wasn't surprised. I, I think the uh, visibility of the two frontrunners, by meaning Schramm and Perez, was very evident throughout the election, and that the uh, remaining four candidates splitting a minimal amount of votes uh, was not a surprise to me. Um, and even the victory of Perez was not a surprise because I think uh, we had talked in our previous program about some of the big issues, whether it's uh, financing regarding Blue Harbor or the uh, building of a police station. There were enough issues that were motivating people to uh, go on to one candidate or the other. Um, and I don't know that you can say that uh, margin of victory or difference of three percentage points uh, mm -hmm. really says a lot. But I, I think I wasn't surprised at all. I, I, I kind of put my money on the two candidates coming out of this uh, handily, and I, and I think they did. Yeah. Anybody surprised, though, that anybody else surprised that Perez actually, will, at least in that, I think Cal's point is well taken. It was a small margin of victory with a fairly, really low turnout of voters, but he won. You know, I think you've got a core of people who are going to be <coughs> uh, opposed to Mayor Schramm uh, no matter who is running, and I think they're more likely and more energized to get out in a February primary and vote, so I thought, too, that um, that Perez might actually win the primary just because his, his backers and his supporters would be more likely to, to show up and vote on the kinds of issues that we talked about in the last episode that mm -hmm. Cal was alluding to. And uh, as we talked about in the last show too, I wasn't too surprised when some of the uh, other candidates who didn't make the, uh, make the cut in the primaries actually turned around and threw their support to, to, uh, to Mr. Perez. So you start adding those in, I don't know if it means much of anything. I think it's going to be who's going to be able to turn out mm -hmm. folks uh, in April, well, what the weather is going to be like <laughs> in April, if we're going to be in the middle of a snowstorm in typical Wisconsin weather, or whether right. we're going to have nice weather like we had past Sunday. And, and uh, you know, perhaps this is a wake-up call for the SRAM campaign, saying, you, you know, you've got, a, you've got a group of people who really, really are energized to work to throw you out of office. Yeah. Um, you better start finding out who your supporters, who your people are, and and get them out to vote. Mm -hmm. Tom? I was, well, I was a little surprised. If you recall the day before the election, I think the uh, police department or police union had a letter to the editor indicating who they are endorsing. Mm -hmm. uh, they were endorsing Mayor Schramm, and they were endorsing, I think, uh, Don Van Akron, and I think they were endorsing uh, Renee, not Rob, Janet Jensen or somebody. Uh, Janine Yench. Janine uh, running against uh, Montmire, Marilyn mm -hmm. Montmire. So I thought, well, uh, just the day before, you know, well that, and surprisingly enough, uh, after, you know, the next day, the surprise was all three who they endorsed finished second. So I thought I was a little surprised at that. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of interesting. Uh, and speaking of that, the, um, 
uh, there were a, a number of aldermanic primaries, and I think one of the more interesting ones was Renee Susha beating Don Van Akron in uh, District 2. Now, if, if my memory again serves me correctly, um, Renee Susha won the third ward, and, and Don Van Akron won the fourth ward, respectively, where each of them lives. Uh, but that was a close vote, too. There's some real philosophical differences between those two candidates in terms of maintaining the status quo versus it's time for a change. Any, mm -hmm. any prognostications on how that one's going to play out? I think a lot of the, the uh, mayoral uh, issues are being revisited by the many different aldermanic races. And so I think you're seeing, even by the lawn sign placements that are around Sheboygan, yeah. uh, you see... <laughs> coalitions grouping. and blocks for <laughs> yeah, yeah, you see these co and pictures of the same candidate with another candidate repeatedly as you go down the block. So I think there's going to be a very strong um, blocking of votes for certain aldermanic candidates as well as for certain uh, mayoral candidates. Now the mayor said, um, and I think properly so, uh, after the um, election results that only 16% of the voters came out to vote, uh, that it was a very low turnout. Historically, however, uh, April elections in particular don't draw very many voters anyway, generally mm -hmm. around 30%, sometimes more, and perhaps because it's a more energized campaign with lots of issues, we may, may see a higher voter turnout. Um, do you think the mayor is right that uh, the fact that it was such a low turnout skewed the results, or is that just going to continue on through uh, through the election returns? Well, I don't know whether there's going to be a bigger, uh, there'll be more voters come uh, April, of course, but how much more? Because there's only one statewide race, and that's the state superintendent race. Um, it's not unusual, however, to get more um, voter turnout when you have other races. If there are a multitude of mm -hmm. school board or a multitude of, of uh, judicial races, mm -hmm. as well as uh, local mayoral races. But right now, there's not much. So it's going to take a lot of motivation on the part of local voters to get mm -hmm. out there. But it's going to be obviously be much higher than 16%. But you still may end up with only 30% of the voters uh, turning out to determine who the next mayor and what the constitution of the uh, new city council in Sheboygan is. Yeah. Okay. I don't think really um, the candidates had an opportunity really to flesh themselves out in the minds of most people. Uh, I don't think many people really paid much attention to the primary. We see a little, a few letters to the editor. We see a couple of articles in the Sheboygan Press mm -hmm. about some of the issues. But when you really press people for a good reason to vote for Juan Perez or a good reason to keep Mayor Schramm in office, whatever it might be. I'm not sure people are really getting a sense of what the differences are. There's, there's some sort of a populist theme that's working, uh, working for Juan's campaign, some sense of bringing the, bringing the voice of people back to the city hall, but um, I, I'm not sure if that's going to be uh, enough to really move lots of people. I just don't know if there's a whole lot of outrage out there right now in the community. Mm -hmm. Um, that's going to that's going to convince people to, to vote against uh, an incumbent. So on the other hand, Sheboygan's got him, in, you know, a bit of a tendency historically not to keep mayors in office for very long. Uh, Mayor Schneider was probably the mm -hmm. exception to that rule a little bit, but mm -hmm. be interesting to see. Well, there are some groups out there that are working. There's this yeah. uh, Save Our Parks group. Yeah. Um, now, how many members they have and how many people they will be able to drag to the polls, I don't know. Uh, some labor organizations are supporting SRAM. Uh, so well, again, what they're able to garner in the way of voter turnout is yet remains to be seen. But there are some groups that are out there that seemingly say there's a lot at stake for their membership, and as a result, they're going to try to get their members out. I think just as the campaign has played out since the primary, um, and this is just my sense, and I'd really be interested in, in your perspective, is that um, Mr. Perez seemed to have gotten the momentum uh, a little bit more earlier on, and I'm very intrigued by the exchange between County Board Chairman Gehring, County Administrative Coordinator Adam Payne, and the mayor. It's almost like Adam Payne is running <laughs> against uh, mm -hmm. the mayor in terms of, of how the things are playing out there. Any sense of how the campaign is going or how what that particular conflict will have in the mix? Think I it'll... Depends upon how I wake up in the morning. 
<laughs> what, side of bed? <laughs> what side of bed I get up? On the right side, he's moving forward. Some days I think Shram is moving, uh, has, uh, is, you know, moving ahead, and then something happens, and I think Juan Perez is moving ahead. So I, I don't have a, a good sense of, of how it's happening in the comments that the, both the county board chair and the, and the uh, Adam Payne have made. I, I don't know how that, that plays out. Uh, Different people have different experiences with uh, uh, Mayor Schramm, and I had experiences with Alderman Schramm. So mm -hmm. how it plays out, I, I don't know. But I do change as day to day, and I, and I look forward to see what's going to happen next. Yeah. And there is that, that core, a, a core group of, of city, of county supervisors from city districts who are clearly supporting the mayor and who are in some conflict than with the county board chair and, and the administrative coordinator. So, so you're bringing the politics of these two large bodies kind of into, into, a, into a conflict. I also remember uh, when Mayor Schneider, then Alderman Schneider, was running against uh, Mayor Susha. Uh, and there was just a few group, few of us on the council that supported Schneider, but most of them supported uh, Mayor Susha. And uh, it, that was an interesting play. Uh, uh, everybody thought that uh, Mayor Schneider was not going to be a, uh, a good mayor. Uh, they just said, doesn't have it, doesn't have it. And to our surprise, he turned out to be one of the Sheboygan's finest, I think. Did a lot for the city. So I don't know how it plays out, but we did have that conflict before, and the, uh, and, uh, and the council was split. I think it sets the stage for the whole debate of how adequate uh, we have cooperation between county and the city, um, when you've got people very visibly several weeks before an election uh, throwing their support one way or another based on what their perception of county-city cooperation is, I think you can kind of conclude that there isn't a heck of a lot of substance to maybe the, the, uh, the cooperative efforts, that we need to have something that's more tangible and more result-oriented uh, because otherwise you wouldn't have this ongoing so-called debate and perception about um, who's doing what and, and how adequate it is. Yeah, I think if, if, if the issue starts becoming, uh, talking about consolidation of services, if all of a sudden people start getting excited about that topic or see that as a significant way to reduce uh, taxes, if that becomes the issue, or if uh, Mr. Perez makes that the issue, and people get excited about that, then I think those types of conversations um, may matter in the way people start thinking about how they're going to vote or not going to vote. If, if people, you know, I don't think really most people in the city of Sheboygan really care much about what the county chair feels about anything mm -hmm. or anybody at any given moment, truth be told, uh, in their day-to-day -day calculations about how things are going inside the city. But if it comes to be, it does, gets to be an issue of, of uh, the Sheridan Park being linked with uh, a county shared police community and you get all those kind of knit together and people start getting excited about that knit or see the connection between those, if, if uh, Mr. Perez can make those connections in people's minds, then um, you know, then it gets to be kind of interesting because you know a lot of people will say, well, we like the park, but the reality is, where do you put the police station if not at the park? Yeah. And then you start getting discussions of of, of shared you know, city and county efforts, mm -hmm. and it gets to be an interesting kind of yeah. discussion. But it really needs to get beyond just the police station. I mean, there. Yeah. When I think of anything that uh, I was not. Uh, a political backer of uh, Governor McCallum, but I think if he had anything to say in his last uh, weeks and months in office is that we need to look at the thousands of units of government that we have and see if we can do with less and have some consolidation. Uh, that includes school districts. I mean, we have 426 school districts, and when you look at the administrative duplication and so on, uh, we could probably just my own guesstimate, probably do away with probably 40 or 50 of those districts mm -hmm. and function very nicely. Yeah. Um, there are, of course, there are many districts that could not consolidate because kids would be on buses for three hours every morning and every evening, and which is just impractical. But there are uh, many cases where governments do overlap, and it would make sense if we could do some uh, consolidation. And we really have not gotten to that seriousness of a conversation as yet, and we probably should. All right. Well, the. The use of the park, Sheridan Park, leads me into our next topic of, of conversation. 
again at the local level because some interesting developments have been happening around the Cargill plant, which used to be the old Schreier malting plant, again in the same neighborhood. And in one of the city of Sheboygan's, um, clearly a working class neighborhood and sometimes bordering on, on, on lots of poor folks uh, living in the area. Um, in fact, on my way out here today, I, I just drove by the plant because I think it's a, a, interesting that huge former malting plant going right down to the river, sort of in prime, prime uh, landscape that uh, these days, you know, if you were developing, you would never let an industrial plant get the, that close to the river or to Lake Michigan or whatever. The proposal is, as I understand it, to convert the plant to an ethanol manufacturing plant, uh, producing uh, 30 or so jobs. Uh, and um, the gentleman who was quoted in the paper last night indicating 100 or so support jobs. I'm not quite sure what that means, but um, and uh, ethanol being an interesting product uh, and the manufacture of ethanol being somewhat difficult has raised some controversy. Uh, there's a citizens group, as I understand. Uh, there will be a meeting with the uh, Cargill people and um, Utica Energy. LLC, I believe, is the, the organization that's going to be working with that, with Cargill. What are your thoughts on this? Is this, uh, are we going to rezone the, the inner city of Sheboygan from, as I understand it, um, an industrial, uh, urban industrial uh, zoning to heavy industrial zoning? I think that's the first step is that rezoning process. Is it going to happen? Should it happen? What are the pluses, minuses? I'm not sure about the plus and minuses, but I had a chance to talk to a couple of people in that citizens group the last couple of weeks because they, they saw the first show and you know, now they've come talking to me. Um, I'm, not quite sure that, I'm not quite sure Do that Do not means. let that go to your head. No, I, I, said, no, and I said Mary Lynn's in charge of this thing and you need to call her. But I think, I think there again is if, if uh, Alderman Perez wants to frame this issue along the same frame as his campaign, you're going to hear... Um, before we talk about substantive, let's talk about process. I think you'll still you know, talk a little bit about the fact that these folks really feel that this was done more or less behind closed doors, that this is something that could potentially impact the quality of our neighborhoods and Sheridan School and the kids over there. And, um, and there's just, just this sense that decisions are being made without people being consulted. And whether that's a fair analysis or not, you know, the perception is, is that the, that the city government pretty much gave the green light and this was pretty much the wheels were greased and this is going to happen and thank goodness we found out about it to, to start putting some sand in the gears. Um, and I think if, 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 you know, Alderman Perez really wants to make that, again, an issue of how government doesn't listen to people, uh, average folks, and wants to talk about his campaign being a return of the voice of the people to the halls of government type of approach, I think... I think that's going to be a big plus for his campaign. I think there are a good number of people, uh, I think it's more than 50 or 60, I think it's starting to, they're starting to reach out and talk to other people. They're starting quite wisely to ask questions as uh, about, well, it's not just our neighborhood, it's going to be what are the properties, uh, even in the entire city of Sheboygan, be like when there's uh, the fumes that come from that factory, uh, air quality issues when Sheboygan already has some serious air quality issues. They're talking about what's the effect going to be at the marina and Blue Harbor if we get a, a strong westerly wind in summer, which is not that unusual in the city of Sheboygan. Uh, so they're starting to actually expand the base of concern uh, to beyond the local neighborhood. And I, I think between now, it'll be interesting to see how much this issue accelerates yes. in the next couple of weeks. And how much science prevails in the mechanism yep. of having yes. uh, input. Um, in my years in government, I went through a number of these. Uh, the Haven nuclear plant mm -hmm. was one. Um, I-43 was another. Mm -hmm. Highway 23, sure. building a four-lane highway was another. Uh, we had landfill uh, discussions at one time, uh, eventually with recycling. Uh, the landfills in Manor, what kind of uh, seemed to us been sufficient for our waste uh, disposal needs. But those types of uh, situations uh, need to be handled with a great deal of uh, public input. Mm -hmm. And without that, then you start getting these accusations that somebody's right. trying to do something to me and uh, I have no say in it. That really, 
as a result of a lot of the controversy, for example, of locating I-43, we revamped our whole eminent domain statutes uh, mm. uh, as a result of that. Uh, power plant siting is another issue. Uh, the statutes were revamped to allow their series of inputs and so on and, and public comment. Uh, so there are models of controversial projects that have been out there that uh, I think send a message that you need to listen to the people and provide opportunity for people to get answers. Um, there is really an answer here someplace. I mean, either this stuff stinks or it doesn't stink, and either it's, know. you know, is, is it minimal or not? Let's find out. There's Somebody can tell us that uh, based on other plants that have been built around the state, and that's the type of answers these people need because there's no reason investing money and then having them, of course, into litigation and whatever that occurs because uh, somehow well, we didn't know it was going to be this bad or whatever happens uh, ensues if it isn't pleasant. Well, of course, we always say there's probably no better way in the world to spend money than on attorney fees, but <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. just my own personal orientation. But uh, we're, there's, we shouldn't underestimate the, the NIMBY influence, yes. the NIMBY yeah. process, not in my backyard. Yeah. And, and, and I we think see it, like, not only the issues that I raised, but uh, up in Manitowoc County, there's been some very large farms that have been developing, these 3,000-head right. farms, and whether the people who are literally maybe several miles away can smell the manure that's produced by thousands of cows, um, is their right to farm supersede their right to have clean air? Uh, we're seeing it in, in sexual uh, predators who are released from prison. And so where you put them, Milwaukee news practically every night is filled with where they're going to build housing now because everybody, nobody wants a sexual predator released and living in a neighborhood, uh, a general neighborhood. So they're looking at housing to be built somewhere in the isolated areas to house these uh, former prisoners. And so we've segued nicely from <laughs> ethanol to sexual predators. <laughs> but, no. <laughs> no, but there's I mean, no shortage, but no, not in my backyard <laughs> yeah, is yeah, what I'm it, saying. Yeah, I, I think Cal said it all is, you know, uh, open public uh, discourse and discussion. And the bottom line may be the smell. I mean, IEPA and the state DNR have certain regulations on emissions and everything else. So the bottom line may be smell. You've got land that's been used industrial it's provided job it's now sitting idle uh, let's have some discussion i think i think cal you said it all and things like the, the i-43 and other things that went on the nuclear power plant i think those have been good things for uh, our state but at the time they were very contentious well and you look at the tax base potentially that the the plant could generate because this is not a tax incremental financing district as i would understand and these folks are not really asking for a lot of money from the city uh, right. which undercuts, you know, Blue Harbor someday will be a, a nice tax producer for the city, but not for a while. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so, you know, we have, it has that advantage. But it's right smack dab in the middle of the city on riverfront property. We've done a really nice job, I think, of uh, former uh, development director Bob Peterson, I think was pretty insightful in terms of the development that has gone along Mm -hmm. uh, down at the at the river and the water that little water park is pretty pretty sweet for for children you know just off of Erie Avenue. Do we want an ethanol plant in the middle of the city? I think uh, it's it's a subs it's a substantial question. Yeah. Well, we have Optenberg, or we have some other plant. I mean, the city's kind of we've had the plants, and the city's kind of grown around them. And now, when they become vacant, do we vacate the the plant, or do we find another use for the plant? Interestingly enough, I understand that Optenberg is looking at, um, they're looking at, uh, after a failed attempt by the workers to take over that, mm -hmm. that failed plant to um, actually tear the plant down and put in uh, condos. And, uh, you, you know, that's prime lakefront property. Mm -hmm. And at least in the 21st century, we take beautiful areas and we don't put um, industrial mm -hmm. plants right along the water as we did when, you know, in the old days, but we, make them even prettier, or at least try to, and I certainly Blue Harbor is, is, has done a nice job of that. Um, we got what's, you gotta close it up, but we got what's called Oz, uh, the two smokestacks at the power plant. We look out our front window and we see the smoke yes. blowing and we say, well, there's Oz. Yes, <laughs> it's the, the plume, the, the plume that comes along, yeah. the, uh, that comes along. It's interesting too, just in terms of process, um, 
the Peaker Power Plant that is being sited in the uh, town of Sheboygan Falls along the Highway 23 corridor. Hardly pristine land right in that particular area. It's, um, I believe we're county, t slightly west of County T and, and, and a Highway 23 intersection, old excavating uh, uh, site. There was quite a lot of public input um, mm -hmm. required by law. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as I am able to determine, ethanol production is not regulated by the Public Service Commission. It's not really considered a, a utility mm -hmm. per se. Um, there are tremendous financial benefits both for the town of Sheboygan and for the Sheboygan County to have that Peaker power plant located there. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars essentially of shared revenue payments um, so that the financial advantage is huge. Maybe a little more tenuous here in the, in the city. I, I, there, there aren't those kinds of, of statutorily mandated shared payments. Makes it a little tougher sell. Well, and, and layered on top of that is just, again, talking with six or seven of the folks that are part of this process. Um, on the community side, there isn't, um, at this point in the process, and maybe it'll change as the conversation continues, um, any sort of trust of large corporations who are coming into town. Uh, I think th so far in the process up until this meeting that's coming up, um, there hasn't been a whole lot of communication. People are getting their information pretty much based upon the experience of other ethanol plants around the country mm -hmm. and you know, doing Google searches yeah. and, and finding, finding those things out and talking to engineers mm -hmm. who are on the outside looking in. And It'll it be interesting to see. It doesn't help to see the debate that's going on in Madison <clears throat> whether all gasoline in Wisconsin ought to have a certain percentage of ethanol in it and that whole debate uh, in opposition that occurs that says, sure. well, it's not as energy efficient as some people would like to believe and so on. So there is a sort of a parallel questioning about the mm -hmm. ethanol economy that some people would like to see us embark upon. It'll be interesting to see if Cargill is actually able to uh, address the concerns of the neighborhood group to the satisfaction yes. of these folks. I, they've got a tough sell ahead of them from what well, I can it, gather at this point. Yeah, and if you'll remember um, the woodworking plant uh, that I think had been associated with the Muth Company. Woodstock. Woodstock, it? there we go. And a neighborhood group got together and, and was not successful in, in, in stopping the, the, the plan from being built, but really put a stick in the wheel, I think, with its lawsuit. And you'll remember Judge Anderson. Uh, there was a jury trial and yeah. minimal damages were assessed and, and uh, Judge Anderson changed the uh, jury verdict, mm -hmm. uh, thinking that it was an unconscionable verdict and increased uh, the award, I think, by $250,000 and was rewarded uh, by a, a recall, recall. <laughs> campaign. Yes, yes he was. Uh, and so talk about the balancing of, 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 of community values. Um, we wanted, to, you know, a, a judge who thought, well, you know, this was a nuisance and, and the neighbors should be compensated for the fact that they couldn't open their, open their windows. And yet a community that was outraged, and I think Mayor Schneider actually was at least, well. I don't know if he was uh, the mayor at the time. Yeah, I don't think so. As we say in the legal world, strike that. But there was a, certainly a community effort to, to recall the judge, uh, which only, only was defeated by the fact that he'd been in office less than a year in, in that particular term. So, well, we're going to have to have uh, folks uh, stay tuned for it because I think uh, as, uh, as the whole matter plays out, it, uh, it's uh, clearly going to be interesting. Who gets the last word? You do. No. You do. The Donahue, <laughs> the Donahue group. So we'll no, these are all issues that will be continuing. I mean, of mm -hmm. course, uh, uh, this whole issue will play out over months, so we'll have an opportunity to re revisit it again. Yeah. We'll ask the candidates. There we go. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> Thanks, and we'll be back together again.